Hello, hi, this is Professor Porter. We're talking about hearsay. We're in the weeds of hearsay and responses that could come from the proponent. We've talked about definitional hearsay under 801C. We talked about uh, not hearsay under 801D, and now we're into the world of exceptions, uh, particularly the reliability exceptions under 803. This video has to do with 8033, what's called the state of mind exception. Um, and in a different video, I'll talk about how the state of mind exception under 8033 is different than a uh, an argument that you might make on the first panel to the left here that the statement is um, not hearsay because it's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted, but instead it's offered for circumstantial evidence of the declarant state of mind. Two different things. One's an exception. One's a definitional argument as to why something's not offered for the truth. I'll separate that out in a different video. This video is about 8033 state of mind exception. And again, we're looking at all the options available to the proponent. This is sort of in a checklist fashion uh, where I would turn to last. I would do uh, some uh, first in the checklist as the proponent. I would be looking at the definition of hearsay and seeing if there's an argument I can make under it, seeing if there's a not hearsay defined uh, definition under 801D, prior and consistent statements, prior consistent statements, prior identifications, statements by or attributed to a party and offered by a party opponent. And then lastly, these narrow patches that the rule gives us, this narrow exceptions that the rules give us, where essentially the circumstances, the context of a statement, including the content of within the quotes of the statement itself, um, lend themselves to a situation where it's an exception. It's reliable enough. Uh, we said that it's accepted from the rule of that we want firsthand testimony and that we want to meet out of court declarants and evaluate their credibility and ask cross examination questions. As long as it fits this narrow circumstance, these narrow circumstances available to the proponent, we're going to allow in the exception. An 8033 state of mind is another example. Just think of the arguments that we make, you know, we've talked about the definitional arguments that we make and the definitional argument that we'd make if something was not hearsay an exemption under 801D for exceptions and an 8033 exception under state of mind, we would say, Your Honor, I'd make my way over to sidebar as proponent. These are all proponents responses. Your Honor, it may be hearsay, but an exception applies. Specifically, this is state of mind under 8033 because, and I'd be talking about the foundational requirements of 8033. Uh, as the proponent to respond to the opponent's hearsay objections. Of course, the opponent does the same thing all the time. They are embracing the definition of hearsay. They are throwing the hearsay flag in the middle of the ring. They're saying 801C, this is an out-of-court statement for truth of the matter asserted. And these exceptions and the circumstances of the exceptions are going to meet a definition of hearsay. But as long as the proponent can satisfy their own foundational requirements for an exception, the statement will be admitted and the objection will be overruled. And we've talked about uh, essentially here are the uh, hearsay exceptions under 803. Here are the narrow patches of uh, circumstances where the rule makers have said, yep, this, this, this makes it reliable enough. And we've talked about a different video, present sense impressions and excited utterances under 8031 and 2 respectively. This is 8033, state of mind. I like to put in the parenthetical with state of mind. Uh, it's easy to remember the state of mind part. Got to remember the plus present intent to do a future act, like we'll talk about in a slide or two. This is the part of the rule that makes it easy. Then existing mental, emotional, or physical condition. And really, if you just think about a declarant, again, that we're probably not meeting at trial, it's going to come through a witness. They're going to say, uh, my friend Doug is going to say, Porter said. And what did Porter say? The out-of-court declarant, what did I say? I, I kind of began with an I'm. I'm what? Something that communicates my state of mind, my emotion, right? So if you think about it, these types of statements, I'm hopeful, that's my state of mind. I'm sad, that's my emotion. I'm dizzy, that's my sensation. I'm hungry, it's my physical condition. Anything that really begins with I'm talking about uh, what's going on with me real time. It almost has some of the same attributes and some of the same underlying policy as 8031, present sense impression, because there's no opportunity for reflection. I'm not thinking back on how I felt yesterday. I'm talking right now, real time, what is my quote unquote then existing condition? So this is the buzzword. These are the flags to look out for. I'm whatever. The declarant says uh, in real time, I'm this. Not 
I was super sad last Thursday when I got my grades back. Not, I was really dizzy when I got off that ride last week at the amusement park. Nope. Those are past looking statements. Those aren't going to qualify. We're only talking about real time, a state of my current condition. I'm hopeful. I'm sad. I'm dizzy. That's what we're talking about. And then it gives us some examples, you know, the mental feeling, the pain, the body health that we understand. I'm hurting. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, mentally fatigued. I'm exhausted. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm in pain. You know, those are those I'm statements. We understand how they meet up with state of mind, emotion, sensation or physical condition. The rule makers included one other thing here. Then existing intent, motive, design makes it a one step more confusing. This rule is really easy if it were just current then existing um, statements about my state of mind, emotion or sensations or physical condition. Because it's sensation and physical condition, I kind of wish they didn't call the rule state of mind. Uh, it, it, it narrows, it's more narrow in its description than the rule implies. It's then existing what's going on with you, then existing your state. Um, but it includes this line, uh, intent, motive, design, uh, and we got to talk about that. And really what this is, this is what it means. These kind of then existing, it's still then existing. It's still I'm statements, right? It's still the declarant talking about what they're going to do real time. But the best way to sum it up is this phrase in brackets. It's the declarant's present intent. I'm intent to do a future act. That's that reflects a plan that reflects a motive that reflects an intent or a design. I'm going to get a bank loan tomorrow. It's my present intent to do a future act. Uh, I decided last week to get a bank loan. No good. Right. Um, uh, you know, uh, yesterday I felt like I should get a bank loan today. So I'm going to do that today. The first part of the statements out. I'm going to do that today is in only those statements that reflect a present intent to do a future act. So this rule is a little bit two headed, right? You think of those physical conditions, those mental conditions, those sensations, those emotions. I am this, I am that, I'm that. And then it includes this kind of other different thing, a present intent for future act. So if you remember this rule, anything going on with your body, anything mental, anything emotional, anything physical, I am this real time then existing, that's one half of the rule. Second one, a little unrelated, a little disconnected, but it starts with the same word. I'm going my expressing my present intent to do a future act. I'm going to uh, go golfing this weekend. I'm uh, going to meet up with my friends next Thursday. My present intent to do a future act, the rule makers have decided that qualifies as um, one of these narrow circumstances where we say it's reliable enough. We don't need to meet that declarant. We don't need to cross-examine that declarant. We don't have to have the jury evaluate the credibility of that declarant. We just get that statement in. Now, this is a great example of this is no guarantee of trustworthiness. This is no uh, guarantee that this statement is going to be truthful. Uh, but we, for some reason, we think people lie less or that it's the statement is more reliable when they're expressing their present intent. I'm going to get a bank loan tomorrow to conduct a future act. We think that we question credibility when they say, I, present intent, uh, went to the bank yesterday to get a bank loan because we're reflecting on it, because we're talking about something historical, because we're talking about something backward looking, we have a reason to question that. And what we want, we wanna meet that person. That declarant's gotta come into court. That declarant, without another exception or another hearsay argument, uh, definitional hearsay argument, that declarant's gotta come to court. That declarant's gotta undergo uh, cross-examination and confrontation, that declarant has to have their jury uh, evaluate their credibility and testify in real-time, first-hand account. Uh, didn't make the rule, uh, but that's the best way to explain it. What's going on with you and your body and your present intent to do a future act? That's what we need from the declarant. That Then my friend who I said it to, Bonnie, she gets to say, Porter said, objection hearsay. It's proper hearsay objection because I said it out of court. It's a statement. It's offered for the truth of the matter asserted about me going to get a bank loan. And the the proponent then would have a number of things available to them. Definitional arguments under 801C, uh, definitional arguments under 801D that something is not hearsay. But lastly, they would get down to the exceptions and particularly the reliability exception. They would say, Your Honor, while this may be hearsay, an exception applies. This is um, 
reporters expressing his present intent to do a future act. It's his intent, his then existing intent to do something in the future. And that qualifies under the foundational requirements under state of mind exception under 8033. Because I'm the proponent and I've met the foundational requirements of an exception, the court should overrule the hearsay objection and allow in this testimony of Bonnie telling, uh, telling the jury that Porter said, I'm going to get a bank loan tomorrow. Just the same way as if Porter said, I'm hopeful, I'm dizzy, and so on. And then to make it one last tier confusing, I think this is the aspect of the rule. People would, uh, students and, and new people new to evidence uh, can get over the first part that it talks about what's going on with your body. It includes that present intent to do a future act because it includes intent, plan, motive, and design. And then they throw in this one line at the end uh, having to do it. You're going to look out for statements that have to do with I remembered, I believe, right? I remember, I believe, because essentially those have a new wrinkle. Uh, I remember high school. I believe uh, that we should all vote. I remember high school. I believe we should all vote. Those are then existing statements. They're then existing statements about a memory, then existing statements about a belief. So I can introduce them. This is one of those rules that fractures out into two different ways. What is the proponent trying to do? If offered to show that I had a memory, it's admissible. If offered to show the fact that I remembered um, that I went to a dance in high school, not allowed. So offered that I had a memory, fine. Offered of the fact I remembered that I went to a dance in high school, not fine. I believe everyone should vote. Offered to prove that I believe something, okay. Offered to prove the fact that I believe that everyone should vote, not okay. So a, a, a confusing little wrinkle, and then there's an exception even to the exception within the exception, and that it has to do with uh, the, uh, the execution, revocation, identification of terms uh, of a declarant's will. Uh, so what we need to think about here is keep in mind the whole rule, the entire rule, that is sensations, what's going on with our body, conditions, mental conditions, how someone's feeling, I'm this statements, and then that includes the present intent to do a future act, and be very weary of statements about I remember. They still have to begin with I. The declarant's still talking about their then existing something, their then existing memory, their then existing belief. But just know it goes to the memory, it goes to the belief. It doesn't go to the fact remembered or the fact believed. And you got to work through some of the hypotheticals to understand that. And here's some of the underlying policy look out for these statements that say i'm this and they're talking about their then existing feelings right what's then existing going on remember that plan part present intent to do a future act uh there's also a uh a circuit split uh, among uh, uh, among the circuits uh, the, the laws kind of all over the place as it relates to uh present intent to do a future act when it's um coupled with another person my wife and I intend to go golfing this weekend. That that can be offered in some jurisdictions to show not only uh, my activity, but my wife's activity who wasn't the declarant. Uh, and it's called the Hillman Doctrine. And there's some other cases that say uh, that it can't be used for that purpose and it must be properly redacted. So know what jurisdiction is and know the arguments that you're supposed to make under Hillman. And just look at these things. We know why sincerity enhances because there's no reflections. And we, we expect someone that's reporting on what's going on with their then existing state of mind, what's in their head, how they feel at the time. Uh, we're willing to say that's reliable enough. We're willing to say that's good enough and just think it's reliable enough circumstances but it's not reliability guaranteed that's what that slide says